Welcome to the day in history for April 30th. Today, we are gonna talk about electrons and the experiments and the man that discovered them. So, today is the day that the English physicist, J.J. Thompson, announces his discovery of the electron. Now, the big idea for today is that one discovery usually leads to another. Um, because there were a lot of discoveries before this that led up to his discovery. Just like when we talked about Edison and the light bulb, he didn't just come up with the light bulb and all its different parts. There were a lot of other things that Edison did before that first light bulb. And the same goes for J.J. Thompson. Okay, so I'll let you write this down. We're in 1897. We are at the Royal Institute and this is the location of where he gave the lecture or the presentation announcing his discovery of the electron. So let's talk a little bit about J.J. Thompson now. Now he uh, was um, born into a family of booksellers. His dad was a bookseller. Um, I would guess and with a little more research I would probably find out that he probably read a lot of books. But he ended up going to the university of Manchester at age 14. At age 14, that's pretty cool. Now, what was interesting about the University of Manchester was that they had some courses on experimental physics. Now, we have to remember, we're in, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s when this day in history is taking place. There was a lot of science and physics that had not been discovered yet. Einstein had not discovered these things yet. So, um, so he went to the University of Manchester, and then later he went to Trinity College again. Remember, we, we already talked about this. Uh, went to Cambridge. Now, after that, um, he studied physics, and he went to work at a place called the Cavendish Lab. Now, the Cavendish Lab was a place where all kinds of amazing science was happening. And what's important to talk about at this time was that it was really a special time in the world of science and physics. Now, electricity was discovered and learned about. I mean, we had learned and known about this electricity for a while, but we were really starting to understand it. And so if we combined all the advancements in our understanding of electricity with other advancements, specifically in magnetism and how magnets interact, um, additionally, if we add thermodynamics, which is how heat and energy are transferred, um, we combine all those together and what we end up with is a greater understanding of how um, electrons and how the atom and how our world works. So that brings us to the cathode ray experiment. Now this interesting device here is called the cathode ray and this is a replica of the one that J.J. Thompson used. Now what's interesting about this is that it also goes back to some of the inventions that Edison used with the vacuum tube because what was special about this was that inside that glass there was no air and if there's no air there's no particles for uh, things to bounce off of and so you could do experiments in what we would call a vacuum. Um, now, the two little metal things there are magnets, a positive and a negative. And what J.J. Um, Thompson did was this. He put electricity through and watched the electrons get bounced off, what we know as electrons today, and then put magnets on either side. And he was able to actually bend the cathode ray and discover that there was something else going on. Now, it's, this is a pretty complicated thing to describe or to uh, explain in just a couple minutes. And there's some really good YouTube videos that you can watch. If you look up J.J. Thompson's uh, cathode ray experiment, you'll see. Um, but what was really cool was that he realized that when you put these magnets on there, he was able to measure the light and he was able to see that the um, that these things were like a thousand, two thousand times smaller than anything that we had discovered before. Because before this, the hydrogen atom was the smallest thing that we knew existed. Before that, there was nothing smaller. And 
he realized that there were these new things that were even smaller. Pretty cool. Now, he ended up winning the Nobel Prize in Physics for this discovery, and um, it really changed a lot of what other people studied afterward. Now, he was not only a physicist, he was also a really, really good teacher. And he said that for people and scientists and physicists, if you teach, when you explain it to other people, you're also kind of explaining it to yourself and you kind of do it in new ways. And so it helps you understand things in different ways. Because if you have to explain it to a new person, um, you have to change the words you say, the way you explain things to get your point across, which in turn explains it a little bit different for you as well. That's one of the reasons I love teaching about history because when I talk about these things, I gain a new level of understanding when I try and explain it to you. So it's pretty fun. Now, what's interesting about these guys is that the people that worked under J.J. Thompson in total had seven more Nobel Prizes. So the people that studied with him and under him also made amazing accomplishments. Now, let's move on and let's talk a little bit about the electron itself. Now, this is kind of the model that we recognize today. We have the big blob over here, which is the nucleus. It has the protons and the neutrons, the positive. And then spinning around the outside, we have the electrons. Now, like I said, this is a very common model of a atom today, but that's not what it used to always be like. In 1803, John Dalton came up with a solid sphere model, and pretty much they thought of the atom as the smallest thing there was. And that's all there was. You couldn't break it up any smaller, and other particles, larger particles, were simply combinations of these solid sphere models. Now, what happened next was what we're talking about today, the J.J. Thompson model. Now, his model that he came up with actually ended up being incorrect. They called it the plum pudding model because what JJ realized was that you had the solid sphere model before, but now you had positive and negative elements. And he kind of saw the negative electrons floating around inside this, uh, this well, pudding. Um, now, didn't turn out to be the case. And so we get to Ernest Rutherford's model, and Ernest Rutherford is actually one of the guys that worked with J.J. Uh, Thompson. He came up with what we call the nuclear model, and this is a model that looks very similar to what we see today. You have the positive in the middle, and you have the negatives going around the outside. Now, a little bit later, you have the planetary model by Niels Bohr. Now, this one uh, didn't quite work because the way that the electrons are set in orbits like planets, I mean, it, it, it makes sense. If you look at it from a logical perspective, you could see how it could make sense, but it didn't explain everything quite right because the ones close, the electrons closer will be moving faster and the ones farther away, it, it just didn't work quite right. So then we get to the quantum model. Now, uh, Erwin Schrodinger, I think that's how you say it, in 1926 came up with the quantum model. And this is what we kind of use today. It looks different than what you commonly see when you say Google the, uh, um, the atom. But we realize that we can't really predict exactly where these electrons are. We can't really see them. They're so small. And so what we realized was that we were going to have to come up with a probability or a estimated location of these electrons. And so it's more like a cloud. And so we can't pinpoint exactly where these electrons will be. We can simply say, there's a pretty good chance that if you look in this area, that's where they're gonna be. And that's why it kind of looks like a cloud. So pretty interesting stuff. Now, the basis of so many things we do today are based on our understanding of how electrons and atoms fit together. Um, it is a really fascinating topic. And there's a pretty good chance that one of you guys watching this, someone in our class, is going to go on to be a physicist. It's an amazingly uh, interesting topic to study because it's really about the building blocks, the very foundation of how our physical world works. Physics 
is what tells me that if I pick up this book and drop it, it's going to move. Physics is about the interaction of that book hitting the floor and how the different particles and atoms and electrons interact. Really fascinating stuff. So I am going to leave you there. Thank you for this day in history, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye, guys.